Good afternoon, Macedonia family. I thought uh, since we're uh, officially having a snow day today um, in lieu of uh, either this morning and or this evening service, however you want to look at it, uh, since I had prepared the Sunday school lesson and we're in the last day of the quarter, uh, so we, uh, we needed to cover Genesis chapter 24. This will be the uh, last uh, chapter that we're going to cover in this quarter for Genesis. Uh, it's the story of Isaac and Rebecca, and since uh, I prepared it, I thought I would go ahead and, and record this so uh, so you you all can enjoy it uh, as you will. Uh, but uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 24, like I said. Uh, let's go through it. So we, in this part of the, the book of Genesis, we are transitioning over from, uh, beginning the transition from Abraham, to Isaac, uh, and generationally we see things progress from here. Uh, Abraham starts to fade from the story uh, as a primary character, uh, and we move on uh, to the to the generations from him and and Esau and Jacob, and and we'll see that move forward. Uh, some of the characters we see in this chapter, uh, some of the folks uh, Laban in particular, we'll see again later, and and we'll talk through some of that. But I want to start with. Uh, the first few verses here. We're not going to cover it. So 24 is a long chapter. We're not going to talk about all of them, uh, but I want to hit a, hit a few of the, the kind of key elements here that uh, set up the conversation. This, the, the whole breadth of this story really is about uh, getting a wife for Isaac, uh, the promised son, uh, and, and Abraham has decided it's time for him to have a wife. And so he, um, I don't know if there's, necessarily any significance to the timing of it. Uh, we're about three years after the death of Sarah. She lived uh, to be 127. So Isaac at this point is 130, or is, sorry, is 37 years old. Uh, Abraham's 137 and, uh, and we're three years, this, and that's the point Sarah passes away. Three years after that, Abraham decides it's time for a wife for Isaac. So that's kind of where we pick up the story. Uh, in chapter 24, uh, if you want to go back and read the, the, the story behind it, in chapter 23, uh, and then things you know, obviously move fairly quickly from here, but uh, but that's that gives you some some context around where we're at. Um, in verse one of chapter 24, it says, "And Abraham was old, and well stricken in age." Uh, and keep in mind, he was 137, and so that, by all our accounts, would be well stricken. Uh, and I apologize, he was 140 at this point, because uh, we're, we're now, uh, Isaac's 40. And, you know, we may go, wow, that's 140 older than anyone we clearly, you know, have any context for in this day and age. Um, but keeping in mind, he has another 35 years left in his life, and and we'll have more from here. So that's where, where we pick up. But he was well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of the house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of, Can of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into my country, and to my kindred, and take my a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou, thou that thou bringest, bring not my son thither again. And I'll, I'll pause there. Uh, so a couple of couple of things are happening right here. Uh, one, Abraham has given the command to his his essentially his primary uh, servant who runs the household. The, the servant is never named in the scripture here. Uh, and we don't see um, we don't see anywhere where he's ever identified. It's generally accepted and believed that it's Eleazar. So we, we if you recall, uh, a while back we studied that Abraham uh, thought that he was going to die without an heir, and that Eleazar would inherit everything, um, which would put him in a position of uh, we'll call it chief importance. Um, don't know exactly what that would have been in that context at the time, but certainly here someone is identified as the, as the chief servant and the head of household. So we're assuming that that's Eleazar. Um, again, not identified, but that's kind of the assumption. Even in the quarterly, it mentions, uh, it starts to refer as Eleazar by name uh, through the rest of the quarterly uh, and 
through the rest of the lesson. But he's, he's given him a command. He's asked him to swear, and, and the hand under the thigh is a significant um, uh, element because it is a, essentially he is swearing on his posterity. He's, he's committing himself upon, you know, essentially swearing on the line of Abraham that he will do this. Um, and, he, and he tells him to, uh, to go back to his homeland. Now, it's worth noting here that the scripture is sometimes used to accuse Abraham of uh, being a racist, honestly. Uh, it's to note, because he says, don't take a wife from the Canaanites, um, it's, when in fact that's not the case. It's not, his motivation was not because he believed that as a, as a people that the Canaanites were inferior or whatever that may be. Um, but it was that they worshipped false gods. And we have examples in the, in the future in the Bible, uh, in, in you know, other books of the Bible, and the history of Israel, where we see what happens. Uh, and Abraham was wise, and he knew that if he adopted that into his family, if he brought uh, the Canaanites into the family uh, and, and made them part of the covenant, if you will, through marriage, that that was not going to be in alignment with what God wanted. And so he sent the servant back to his homeland, to his people where he had come from, uh, and it at least in this context appears that they still worship God. Uh, so he went, he, the servant went back to his homeland. So that's where we, where we find him. And, and so the servant did as he, as he commanded, uh, and Abraham said, if she won't come with you, then you're free from your oath. But, uh, but don't take him there. And, and that was interesting to note as well that he was very clear, don't take Isaac back. Uh, God had called him out, uh, clearly never to return, it appears, uh, although we do see Jacob later go back to that homeland to get his wife. Um, and, you know, trouble, okay, in fact, came from that uh, to an extent. Um, but we, Abraham was very adamant that, you know, Isaac was supposed to stay in Israel. That was the promised land, and uh, the servant was to go get the get his wife. And so the servant didn't doesn't indicate that he hesitated at all. Um, in verse ten, it says, "And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, uh, for all the goods of his master were in his hand." And he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. So he went back. We if you recall uh, these this area was where Abraham was from originally, as Abram at the time. And, and so he went back there. Uh, it's worth noting he took 10 camels. Camels, even today, are a sign of wealth. A camel is a very valuable creature. Uh, and back in this time, they would have been even, uh, even more significant. So uh, I don't know if it's a, if it's a safe approximation, but uh, it's like taking, uh, I guess, the equivalent of 10 semi-trucks, um, because that would have been what a camel was at that point. Uh, it was the served the purpose of, of tractor trailers and today and hauling cargo over vast distances. So he took 10 of them. Uh, so it's, a sh it's not necessarily as a show of wealth, but it certainly does show the wealth of Abraham. And so he went and he traveled back to the homeland. And, and you know, you, we, dr we travel places and we drive and we go and we, um, you know, when we get somewhere, we generally have an idea of what we're there for or where we're going. We look at maps and we search the internet and where we use navigation to get where we're going. But imagine you are headed from one area to another general area, uh, basically go east um, and, and go back to this place and find my family and get a wife. That sounds, and we see it in, in terms here, um, that seem fairly straightforward because the way it's written, but we're going to note here how uh, incredible this really was, because even Eleazar realizes it, uh, or the servant realizes it when he when he gets to where he's going. Uh, we'll pick it up again in, let's see, verse 13, or this verse 12. It's um, because he got into the, to the place, and he was by a well, and, and he, so he prays, uh, because he, he wants the Lord's help and favor in his, in his quest. So, uh, he's made the, the long journey back um, to where he's headed, and, and now he's praying. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. 
Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass, that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Now, the servant is here, he's at the well, he doesn't know what he's going to do yet, he's still formulating his plan, uh, but he just says, you know what, let's stop and pray. And so he prays at the outset of this journey, at the, at the outset of this endeavor, um, and he says, God, and I think he fully realizes he's on a quest to find a person, a needle in the haystack, if you will. Uh, there is a wife to be found here, he clearly knows that, um, but he has no idea how to find her, and so he just says, God, bring her to me. Uh, and he, he prays and he lays out some very clear parameters. Uh, we might say, you know, well, it sounds like he's, he's kind of ordering God around or he's, he's demanding that God, you know, do these things this way. Uh, but he is, he is submitting himself. He is putting everything on the line saying, God, I'm going to trust that the person you send in this situation is going to be the one, uh, knowing that God will provide. He's, He's saying, by no means of his own, by no power of his own, is Eleazar going to find this person. He is fully dependent on God to do it. And so he lays that out uh, in front of God. And we, we see that this was, uh, this was the right thing to do because God immediately, and, and even more so um, before I think he even finished praying the prayer. Uh, and we see in verse... Uh, Let's see, it's in verse 15. And it came to pass, yes, verse 15. And it came to pass before he had done speaking, so he had not finished praying, that behold, Rebekah came out, of, came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. So he had not finished praying the prayer, and God had already answered it. Think about that for just a minute. Do we have that kind of faith in God that we believe that he has already answered our prayer before, before we've prayed it? Um, and, and you can think in terms of some events, uh, and, and we don't generally think of it this way, but we, we pray for healing and, and people are healed. And we say, oh, well, so they get, God to get provided a good doctor. Okay, but now back that up. That preparation for that healing event started perhaps when that doctor was in medical school or even prior. Um, we don't, I think we underestimate what God is capable of and the, the lengths that he will go to for his children. Uh, and And by doing so, we diminish our own, value in his eyes. Uh, we, we diminish what our worth is, um, and we see this, where we, we don't give enough, put enough value on, uh, on a human, on a person, uh, and, and that has impact. But God sees us, he hears our prayers, and we see it all through the Bible, um, many times, how uh, Nineveh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Egyptians, uh, where people were crying out and ag against someone, and God heard them. And, and God went forward to answer the prayers. And in some cases, he started laying the groundwork for answers to prayers hundreds of years before the event. So the Rebecca comes out. He meets her. He, he, he goes through. He asks her the question. She provides water, waters his camels. He, he watches, um, and God confirms this is the, this is the woman for Isaac. Uh, this is to be his future wife, and you know, and as he goes through, then we'll see here. It, it lays out he, you know, she offers him a place to stay for the night with you know, for his camels. Um, they show him great hospitality, and then he meets her family. And in verse twenty nine, it says, "And Rebecca had a brother, and his name was Laban." And Laban ran out unto the man, unto the well. And so she had told the family what, was, what had happened, and so Laban runs out, not goes out, he runs out to meet the man. Um, which is, when we see Laban here, um, we don't know what happened.
happens between this series of events and when Jacob goes back, um, but to his uncle Laban, uh, same guy. But we, he's a, he, he behaves differently the next time. Um, and, but in this case, we see Laban making a very faithful and, and forward, you know, forward-looking uh, effort in receiving the servant. He receives him. They show him great hospitality. They give him a place to stay. They treat him well. Um, they discuss the the marriage, uh, and and he explains the in verse thirty five. And keep in mind, this isn't this isn't a, a culture or a time where people know what's going on. They've they know Abram and Sarah left, but they may not have any clue what's happened to them since, and so. There's a bit of an aspect of this of learning what has happened to their family in a far-off land, uh, and Eliezer, you know, lays some of that out. And there was meat set before him, uh, and he, and he, but he insisted on telling him the heir, telling them the errand. Uh, and in verse thirty-six, it says, "And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son unto my master when he was when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath." Um, and then he explains the, the promise that he had to make um, to not find a wife from the Canaanites and go back. Uh, and, and he said, and then he's conveying what Abraham had stated to Eleazar. He says in verse 40, And he said unto me, The Lord, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this thy oath, when thou comest to my kindred, and if thou give not thee one, then thou shalt be clear. So he's, he's saying this is this is the oath and this is the promise. Uh, and he's free if they don't provide a wife. But they do clearly, and, he, and then he explains what his prayer was to God and how God fulfilled that. And so we see this, this, this tale told repeatedly, uh, both of the promise, the fulfillment of the promise, of God's faithfulness, and... You know, I, I can't imagine being in the shoes of someone uh, like Rebecca, who's hearing this, hearing this story and and the tale, and what realizing that she is the fulfillment of of what was prayed for. Um, but again, we have to remember how often in our lives are we the fulfillment of someone else's prayer, and I don't I don't mean that that we are going to do something miraculous. I mean, our common everyday activities, uh, praying for someone, sitting with someone, uh, showing up when they need a friend, uh, being there to talk to them, uh, simply providing a meal, whatever that may be, the simple little things of everyday life are answers to prayers oftentimes. And when we only look for big things and we only expect big, dramatic events to occur, we overlook and miss out on the little things in the everyday, uh, in all of the ways that God provides. And so they had their meal, uh, and and ultimately, Laban, and it's not clear why her father was not uh, as involved in this conversation. Laban seems to lead the, the discussion, the negotiation, or the conversation around uh, Rebecca being the wife. Uh, but they they called Rebecca to say, and they ultimately said, "We'll leave it up to her," because they wanted her to stay for another few days. So imagine, you know, this all seems to take place very very quickly. Uh, so imagine, you know, somebody, a stranger, the servant of a relative shows up and says, "I'm here for a wife for your, you know, relative's son, and I'm going to pack your daughter up and take her away, and you're never going to see her again, most likely." Um, we don't. We read this, and we don't really read that into it. But that's what's happening. There's a family who has a beloved daughter that is getting ready to hop on a camel and maybe go away forever. And they're trusting that this is from the that the servant is being truthful in what he's saying. So, the, you know, we read we read through this. But there's a lot of complexity going on here, and you would think of the emotion and the feelings and the hesitancy and the resistance. But you know, in the end, all of these people are faithful to God and surrendering to His will. He's this is what God has has set forward. Uh, but they bring Rebecca in, and she she says, "I will go." 
And so they sent her away. So then it's in verse 59. And they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah, and in verse 60, this is an interesting blessing, because they say, uh, they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. So they blessed her and told her to be the mother of thousands of millions, which is, uh, which is a large number, and which also meshes with God's promise that they will be numbered as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. All of those things come together. Uh, but in verse 61, she packs up and she, she leaves with the servant. Um, and in verse 62, we see, As Isaac came from the way, the well of Laharoi, for he dwelt in the south country. Uh, this is where Isaac was dwelling. Um, and then he's about 40 at this point. And Isaac went out to meditate, in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes, and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant has said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil, and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. It's a very brief way of telling the story, but in verse 66 we see compressed all of the events of the trip. Uh, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And we, at that point, close the, the book on, on the lessons for the quarter, um, and in some small part, the, the story of Abraham. We see uh, in chapter 25, it expands upon kind of the events of his life, because Abraham has more sons uh, by another wife. And uh, and he it's interesting to read, and you read through that, and, and look at some of the things that he does. Uh, he specifically sends those sons off uh, into the east. Um, and so you'll see a, a pattern develop there. Uh, but he, the son of promise, Isaac, uh, now has his wife, and God has fulfilled that part of the covenant. If you read on ahead uh, into Jacob and Esau, you see that it's about 20 years after this. So uh, imagine uh, being 40, getting married at 40, uh, and then you have your first kids at 60, which is what it says that Isaac was 60 when they were born. Uh, and if I did my math right, uh, Abraham would have then been about 160, and so he would have had 15 years left. And so his grandsons, uh, Jacob and Esau, where it would have been about 15, I believe, when Abraham dies. And so that's so he was seen, starting to see the fulfillment of that. But even Abraham, who had the direct promise from God, uh, you know, only saw a small portion of that fulfilled. Uh, not, uh, you know, he didn't live to see the millions upon millions of, of descendants that he would have. But it's, you know, we see again in chapter 24, uh, the persistence of God in being faithful in, in all that he's promised. And those same promises, those, uh, and God's behavior and his response to those promises, what God does with these promises, carries forward to our promises. Uh, he is as faithful with us as he ever was or ever will be. Uh, he, he's unchanging. And that's, the, that's something to keep in mind in all of this, is that God does not change. Therefore, his promises to us for salvation and for hope and for uh, restoration, for, for provision and supply. As we think of uh, what's going on in the world right now and, and, you know, at this point in time, you know, the, the believers and the faithful in Ukraine are going through some very, very difficult situations. Some things that most of us can't imagine because uh, we've never had an experience like this. Uh, but the stories that are coming out of of people kneeling to pray on the concrete in the middle of you know, conflict um, and in the middle of, of danger and, ex and and not only expecting but knowing that God is going to provide for them uh, and he will he will provide uh, maybe not the way we think of providing maybe not by our standards or by definition but I am not about to put a put God in a box if you will and expect him to answer my prayers the way that I want. Uh, 
I, I will pray and God will answer. And I know that. And I will leave the, the rest up to him. Uh, so that's what we have to be faithful with. That's what we have to persevere in, uh, in the midst of our culture, in the midst of what we're dealing with and the world around us. Uh, just stay faithful to him because God will always be faithful to us.